This is a presentation recently given at the ICAST 2015 conference covering the generation of whole surface from laser point clouds. Over the last few years, a lot of the developments in PolyCAD have focused on capturing surfaces from existing geometry. For example, that might be information held in images that have been created by scanning plans, uh, sections, or other surfaces that may have been part of solid modeling uh, definitions that have now broken. And this use of laser scanning is kind of an extension of that strategy to kind of rebuild uh, surfaces from, from existing uh, geometry information. The only challenge with laser scanning is that we're now dealing with a, a considerable amount of data that can be in the, in the gigabytes, and it's not always clear the quality of the data. So the key points of the presentation is that compared to other areas where optical scanning is used, this is a slightly different challenge. When you scan a ship or a boat, it's outside of its normal environment. It's not floating, it's in a dry dock. Um, when it's in a dry dock, it has to be supported by structure that would obscure parts of the surface. Uh, and often there's work going around around the outside that may uh, stop you getting a good, good view of the ship. Um, and there can be work that may influence the, the laser scan head. Following the scan, when we need to go through the process of turning that geometry into a surface. What's happening at the moment is that there's a lot of generic solutions out there that you're using um, simple fitting algorithms for surfaces, and they find it a challenge to account for this particular scenario. And this means that some of the surfaces that are being generated are often too complicated for uh, the engineering analysis that we need to do. They can be uh, relying on solid modeling or they can have a lot of points. The marine industry has been defining surfaces suitable for its engineering analysis for decades now and I feel that it would be a much better approach if these solutions were enhanced to accommodate laser scan data inside the applications. This is obviously what we're going to do and if we're going to do something we like to do it right so why not utilize all the information and the technology to try and find and deliver the best approach which gives you the best definition in the shortest amount of time. So let's have a look at the current situation. So here is a scenario which shows a, a laser scan head in a non-marine environment. It's scanning um, some plant. Uh, we can see that we um, have some concrete columns and a lot of pipes. So the challenge with the, the optical scanning process is that it can only capture what it sees. It can't capture the other side of the concrete columns and it cannot capture the other side of the pipes because from this position we cannot see them. We can capture it by moving the scan to a new uh, scanning head to a new position where we take another scan and throughout uh, a sequence of these scans we can build up an almost complete image of the area that we want to survey. We say almost complete because there will always be areas that are a challenge to capture. There will be areas that we cannot see because we're restricted on access or there may be safety impl implications from going to those places to scan those locations. So within this area, for example, areas where there's complicated piping, perhaps at the bottom of the upper floor, might be more of a challenge than other areas. But this is part of a much wider process. Once we've collected a number of scans, we will go into the software environment to register them, to make them all synchronized together to get a, a proper survey set of data. Following that, we would clean the data up. Uh, the example would be that if you were scanning inside a dry dock, then you would want to remove all the information that was captured about the dry dock itself, leaving just the ship definition inside it. After that, we have uh, a survey, a set of data that we can use to fit the surface we would take the data to another piece of software and we might need to use a person with other expertise to generate the surface there. Following that, we would then want to use the surface. Again, this most likely will require another person with different expertise. Um, and it will be likely that we need to uh, take that surface through a set of inf in interfaces to, to make it uh, compatible with the other system. 
um, that person that's using it might not be in the same organization they might be using different pieces of software so there's a chance that different systems and time between sending things might make the data degrade over time because of the different software that's being used or people might modify the data so let's have a look at this process in a little deeper this um, is an image of a museum vessel a submarine that is in a dry dock this is actually a quite a good uh, well exposed surveying environment we can see the the exposed hull surface towards the upper area of the image but then along the keel we have all the keel blocks that are supporting the vessel and if we were to scan this then this area would be quite complicated certainly it would be very very challenging for an algorithm to automatically determine the surface shape in this area so we would need to turn to the human to distinguish between what is useful for the hull definition and what needs to be excluded as part of the the dry dock structure um, this isn't a uh, a vessel that's currently in operation a commercial ship for example should spend as little time as possible in dry dock because it's not earning money while it's there while it's there it will be worked on there'll be staging and scaffolding around the outside there may be machinery that influences the scan head by break, um, imparting vibrations say for example a cherry picker with a single cylinder engine so all this can affect the scanning process and we might not get uh, the perfect solution that we were looking for and as it's expensive to um, to rescan things sometimes we have to deal with the situation that if the scan hasn't gone well we just have to accept the data the way it is uh, some examples of some scan data this is the first set data set I dealt with um, a 48 meter schooner this data set consists of 250 million points I believe it was surveyed at night in a floating dry dock and we can see that the color definition is quite poor even though I've enhanced it as much as I can. Um, it's a detailed scan, we can see the anchor chain, we can see all of the deck arrangement. If we zoom in a little deeper we can see parts of the whole form, we can see rivets and some of the structural banding from the keel we've got the propeller in fact we've got two images of the propeller it looks as though it was moved during the process on the deck we can see the wheel any mooring um, we can actually see the planks of the deck so some quite good definition there if we go to a well lit area like the accommodation we can see a vacuum cleaner there's some hard hats a stool even cups on the table but from a whole generation perspective all of this information is is not necessarily what I need, um, I reason, within reason I need something that's fairly simple. So really the objective is to find a way to make this data accessible from a naval architecture point of view. A simple way of doing that is to just intercept the cloud with planes and we see that we got here what looks like curves. They're not curves, these are just the data points um, associated with the planes, the they're close to the planes but there's so many of them it looks like we're, we're looking at curve um, but this is a nice way of, of accessing the data and seeing what we've got to deal with and uh, starting or gives us the opportunity to start to plan how we'll put the surface together at the other end of the spectrum we have a mega yacht here uh, this one only has 8 million points and when we look at the image we see that the top sides of the whole surface are missing we'll come to that later but even in the underwater section we can see quite a lot of white areas where the scan hasn't really captured it that well if we go to onto the contours we can see quite a lot of gaps and we can also see some of the appendages as well such as the uh, the stabilizers and the rudders and these will be items that we might want to exclude from the surface we would include them as separate objects because the surface would needs to be as, as simple as possible perhaps for our engineering analysis software perhaps we're interested in in some stability uh, work this is a, a, a photograph of the survey environment uh, we can see here that the top sides of the vessel are very reflective um, because of that they would not have returned the laser back to the survey head this can also happen with submarines that have a, a very absorbent surface uh, uh, where the, the lasers just doesn't get returned at all both of these 
situations highlight some of the practical challenges that you need to deal with. Despite that, this is a very um, a very open scenario for scanning the ship. We don't necessarily have a lot of supports around the vessel. It's not in a confined area. So certainly for the below the waterline area, we should have got a, a very nice, uh, complete scan. But we didn't, and that's that's the way it works. Moving on now to look at surface generation. This here is the example of what was done with the schooner in some other surface fitting software. We can see that the process mainly involved draping a surface over the data. We end up with a surface that has quite a lot of control points and this is a particular challenge if you want to do anything with the surface because we've got so many points that even small influences on an individual point will cause the surface to become unfair. We also can see that as we've draped the surface over the, the hull, then there have been no uh, areas where we've tried to capture the features of the surface. So there's no control points particularly focused on the boundaries of the surface. And uh, we can also see in the shading a, a, a clearly defined rabbit line between the keel and the whole surface, and that's not captured in the surface either. So we we, we've got a capture of the surface, it's probably most likely quite smooth, but it's not necessarily got the particular details that we might want to be encaptured in the definition from a naval architecture perspective. So as we've got such a large surface and we haven't really captured the boundaries, we need to take it a stage further and that can be done using solid modeling tools. We can trim the surfaces, we can use more surfaces and build a complete definition. Um, solid modeling comes with challenges. Um, these are complicated mathematical libraries that involve numerical algorithms, they involve tolerances. Different CAD software have different implementations. When you take one definition from one system to another it may be changed, it may be altered, the tolerances might not be accepted and over time gaps can appear. Um, this is just the way that it works with solid modeling. The challenge for a lot of the analysis software is that to have um, a solid model incorporated in your tool is, um, is quite expensive or quite complicated to use a free library. So going directly to the solid model can exclude you from doing certain types of engineering um, analysis. Ultimately, we'd like the definition a little bit simpler. So to summarize the challenge, at the survey end, we're dealing with something that is got a lot of practical implications. We're just optically scanning a surface. That process is subject to noise from the environment or just from the process, which means that we might not get everything that we expect to get. A shiny surface can completely stop the, the laser from being returned. Um, so that might mean at the end of that process the laser cloud is, is not in, not complete and we might got, get other features such as all of our dry dock supports or appendages that we might not want in our final version of the surface. We might want to do something else with those. So because the cloud is not necessarily guaranteed to be complete, the opportunity to use automated surface fitting is lessened somewhat. You have to make um, allowances for it. And in the second case, we saw a typical example of a surface being fitted to a hole from them. We had to deal with a case where we have a rather complicated surface with a lot of control points. And because we've overlapped the boundaries, we've then gone on to use solid modeling to try and put that into um, a nice tidy surface. So neither of these cases are particularly good from an engineering perspective where we've kind of got to use a lot of, I suppose you could say, workarounds to get the best out of the, the data that's there. So maybe we can find a better approach. In the marine world, certainly for commercial vessels, commercial ships, the software def the sorry, the hull definition process is often different. Uh, it's often using a lot of curves rather than directly manipulating the surface. Curve networks are a good tool for controlling the different details in a hull form, particularly for a ship. We have areas such as the flat side, which are planar. These areas don't really need much definition. Uh, we can get by with a, a few number of surfaces or even directly as a plane. 
But then in other areas of the surface, such as around the bow, around the bulb, where we've got some quite sharp curvature, we need to get the right definition in those locations to um, allow for the, the correct steel production process and the sharp corners that are there. So the curve network allows us to make an irregular pattern of shapes. We can have coarse areas where it's flat and quite detailed areas where there's a lot of curvature and we can transition the shapes from one to another by just depending on where we put the curves. The relationship between the um, the laser cloud in terms of the curves and the actual curve definition is clearly highlighted here. Um, back with the schooner we did some simple cuts of the cloud using some planes and we captured some what looked like curves. These were just sequences of points and we can fit curves to sequences of points very easily. So what we have here is a very easy process that we can use to selectively slice through the cloud in areas that we feel are good and generate a curve for this type of surface definition very easily. Highlighting that in more detail, what this process does is, is be very selective about where it captures the geometry from. This view is fairly showing a very tidy view of the, the survey, but we see that we have those appendages there that we might not want to put into the surface. And by using planar cuts to generate a curve, we can selectively look at where we're going to put our definition around the surface. We can choose the best locations, we can choose locations that are going to avoid any problem areas within the point cloud. So focusing now more de de in more detail on the curves, um, we've got the capability to do a lot more with the curve definitions than we have with the surface. Um, this is just a sequence of eight control points. And depending on how we want to interpret the control points, we can get different types of geometry. We can start to define what we want from these control points. Uh, in this second case, we have a cubic spline, a case where the curve interpolates the points rather than just approximates them in the case, as in the case of the B-spline. We can apply some specific features. We can apply our design intent to the definition. We can get a straight segment. We can get a knuckle. Internally, this has the effect are splitting the curve up into multiple mathematical definitions, but as far as the user is concerned, this doesn't really matter at all. So it's quite quite a good way of getting different shapes into the curve to um, put, it, put in certain features that we'll find in the whole surface. And we can apply these ideas to that curve network that we saw earlier. We can apply constraints to individual curves so that all the other curves that intersect with it behave in the same way. This is a scenario that shows a sequence of sections fitted through four curves that control the longitudinal shape of the vessel. If we change the constraints on those interior curves to tangents which are parallel to the curves that they're connected to, with that small change we quickly see that we can get a, a shape that represents a ship very easily. Of course we have some other constraints that can create some slightly more weirder shapes. For this particular scenario, they might be inappropriate, but there may be others where these types of constraints may be useful. So we have a set of constraints and we can use them within our curve network. And they'll be found under the main curves that separate different areas of the whole shape from each other. So the constraints on these curves will be used to make sure that the curves are compatible across those boundaries and to reduce the amount of work that we need to do to make sure that these curves have the correct tangency in those locations. So by applying a description, these uh, curves automatically pick up the correct shape without us having to do any precise mathematical con uh, configuration of points. So we have a way of controlling or setting up a, a structure in which we can get uh, the whole form. Now we need to go through the process of finding a way to get the shape of our um, point cloud into the curves that we're going to pick from it. This image is a, a cut through of the, the schooner survey data. And if we look a little bit detail, we see the kind of things, the quality of the data that we're dealing with. It's not perfect. It clearly shows where um, data has been obscured because the laser cannot see it. And it shows the level of noise that we're dealing with. So as the data is not perfect, we need to find strategies that help the way that we can manipulate and access this data. One of the ways is by putting the data inside a map. 
This makes it far easier to find ways of accessing the points because by looking in the cell we can find all of the points located around the area rather than having to search every one. And we also have the challenge of dealing with a considerable amount of data. For example, if we uh, slice uh, a waterline through a whole form such as these, we'll find that we get around 100,000 points. Putting 100,000 points in a fitting algorithm is possible, but it's a very slow process. Certainly a curve won't be fitted in a, an interactive amount of time. So alternatively, what we could do is take a single point from each map cell to reduce the number of points that we're fitting to um, without reducing the uh, accuracy of the curve, we still have around a thousand points and this makes the process of fitting a curve to this data much quicker. An example will be such as this where we have our, our network of uh, map cells and we obtain a single point from each cell. The map cells also help us to understand the structure of the data. We can establish the adjacency of points and connect them into a nice tidy curve. That doesn't always work. In areas where the cloud is, is poor, where it's got holes, we can get a different result if we're not particularly careful in the way that we connect things together. A simple sort of adjacency doesn't always work out well. We have to find another strategy. Uh, one way of doing that is by uh, using the network of map cells to create uh, the idea of shortest routes through the uh, through the, um, the survey data. So here are our points obtained from each cell and if we try to find the shortest route from one direction to another uh, if we, and we give ourselves the opportunity to jump sections of the curve we could end up with curves like this. So these two cases where we have a support on the side of the whole form this kind of solution allows us to ignore that support data because either it's disconnected or by following that boundary it's a far longer way to go than it is if we just jumped through the most logical route through the data. So now we've got a section of points and we know how they connect together now we can fit a curve to that data. The most logical algorithm to use in this particular case is a least squares. Uh, these are very good for fitting B splines as well as um, the kinds of mathematics that we might have dealt with at a, a school level understanding of this uh, kind of problem. Least squares has advantages over other algorithms such as cubic spline is in that it gives us the ability to stipulate how many control points we want to use to fit the curve data within reason. Now we must remember that this uh, curve segment is probably connected at the ends to the curve network and at the curve network we have our, our attributes, the shapes that we want that part of the, the whole form to be, which means that there are tangents applied to this curve. And we can incorporate that into the algorithm by reconfiguring the, the solution process, adding a few more equations. We can calculate the curvature qualities of the curve. It might not be good. Um, if we wanted to improve that, we could further extend the algorithm to add some smoothing and we can improve the characteristics like that. However, when we do introduce smoothing, it means that um, we're starting to make the curve diverge from its original fitted data. And that might not necessarily be the thing that we want to do, but it does mean that we, we have the opportunity to make it smooth. Um, so we've got a decision there. Uh, that's something that the user interface can allow us to address. It gives us some parameters to work with. We can see how the curve responds to these kind of parameters. Um, we can determine the number of control points that we're going to use on the curve uh, so that we can make sure that we have consistent mathematics across the area of the, the hull. And um, this gives us an opportunity, this kind of display to pause um, because we have to review what we're doing and that gives the user the opportunity to think ahead and to plan their best approach. So it stops them, stops them kind of rushing ahead and just makes them think about the quality a little. Let's apply both these um, solutions to this particular case of fitting a, a curve to an intersection, a plane of slice through this, this data here. So if we take the points from that slice, we get something that looks like this, a sequence of points. 
and if we fitted a, uh, a curve to it just simply then using the least squares we'd get a set of control points that were pretty much uniformly spaced. On its own this kind of approach doesn't pick up the structure of the whole form, it doesn't account for the area of flat side where we've got a straight segment, it wouldn't account for the stem rounding. Um, so in the straight segment we've got far too many control points than we really need and in the rounding area where it's a lot smaller we don't really have enough control points it's it's only two it's only really controlling the tangent so to try and get the best shape here we would have to um, either increase the number of points so that we have quite a lot enough on the at least the rounding to take account of the uniform spacing so that everywhere is okay or do something else so what we can do is use the uh, curve network the information within it to separate the different sections of the, the fitting process. We can make them correspond and remember again that we have those constraints on the curve network and what these will do is apply tangents in each direction to make sure that this curve is configured correctly to fit up the shape of the whole form that we're expecting. And then when we go and fit curves to this rather than fit uh, one single segment we're fitting three segments the straight segment has no points on it. The shape segment has uniformly spaced points with the correct tangents at each end. With the stem rounding, we have a decision. We can use a, um, a, a, an automatic algorithm to create a simple arc shape, or we could fit that in more detail by using exactly the same process that we have in the shaped area. The interface for this gets a little bit more complicated. Rather than one segment, we have to account for the different segments and we give the user the opportunity to independently control the parameters and the fit for each of the segments independently. So we'll now put that whole process together for a complete survey uh, data set. Going back to the schooner, we can go and have a look at the underwater section and again we'll highlight those missing sections of the surface which we can see more clearly when we look at the kind of the, the intersections around the contours of the vessel. And the first stage is to create the, the core curve network, the one that contains all the characteristics, the constraints. For this particular vessel, it's not a particularly helpful network. It doesn't, it's the shape of the ship doesn't have um, a clearly defined parallel middle body. It just has some outer shapes along the keel we have a blend. And because most of the, um, the curves in this area are focused around the keel, which is quite complicated, it's got a lot of supports, it was quite a challenge to find the correct shape in that area. It took quite a lot of time to humanly interpret what the cloud was trying to tell us. But once we define these curves, then we can quickly go ahead and create the shape curves. This happened very quickly. We just make our uh, plane, define the plane, slice it, and then fit a curve. And all the curves have pretty much the same number of points, so they're all consistently generating the same kind of mathematics. Following that, we would slice or connect up the curve network in the other direction using some simple B-spline curves that are fitted using a cubic spline. And now we have a, a complete surface. We've got, we've got space for a lot of patches to be generated. We'll use a surface like this. We can see the contours here. We could compare these curves visually with the contours that we've cut from the, the, um, the optical survey data set. Of course, we could go on and analyze the curvature it's in general not so bad but there are areas where the, um, the patches start to elongate that the curvature gets a little bit less than desirable um, so that would be the complete process and we move on to talk a little bit about the performance of this process for the shape curves themselves that process can be generated and done in quite a quick amount of time 20 minutes which is far quicker than you would be able to do through normal manual means. However, we did need the core curve network to start with and that can take much longer, particularly in this case because the most of the curves are were located around the keel and because the keel has got a lot of the support areas around there, it was very difficult to understand exactly what was going on with the shape. A number of case studies have been done using this technique. Um, the case before last looked at creating the whole definition for a type 23 frigate. 
Um, this was an interesting case study because it was not done by me. It was done in a commercial environment by people who had to learn the software. And this was the first time that we encountered the need to validate the surface properly. And the validation was needed not only so that you knew whether the surface was accurate, but you had the information to communicate the level of accuracy to your management and to your customer who might not have been so well versed in what you were trying to do. Subsequently, the project involving the 48 meter Megayop was the first to actually use the validation process during the generation of the whole form. So this means that this was a process where we had the validation process to drive the accuracy of the surface. So returning to that and the validation discussion itself, um, this would be the desirable kind of definition that we would want. Um, a case where the surface is right outside the, uh, the, the survey cloud is very easy to pick up. We can see it graphically because when you render the surface, all the points are on one side of the surface and not on the other. The challenge is to deal with the, the other cases where the surface is very close to being accurate, but how accurate is the question. This is a typical situation that we might have to deal with where the surface is kind of oscillating from one side of the cloud to another. Actually, this is quite an easy case that occurs because when we fit our shape curves indicated by these two dots that we'd be going in and out of the screen, then when we come subsequently to fit the, the B splines by the cubic spline, the, because we're just splining them, the mathematics of the hull shape itself might not be compatible with the curves that we're fitting. So we can get some small um, oscillations. The question is, is this, uh, is this too much? Are we there? How, what's, the, what's the level of uh, accuracy that we're actually getting there? Is it is acceptable? So we've got to go and measure this. And we have to consider that we have a considerable amount of data. And if we're not careful, it's going to take some minutes to do the analysis. So rather than doing a full three-dimensional analysis, we can start to simplify things simply by just analyzing normal to the surface then we only have to measure in one direction. We'll of course take the mean and we have to remember that in this case neither of the uh, mean from the the point cloud or the surface is the concept, has the concept of truth. The point cloud is surveyed, it is influenced by the statistics of the measuring process and the environment and in the same way the surface is just a product of that data in the first place. So really we're just looking at how closely these correspond together. So the, the mean is one measurement, it tells us how close absolutely we are to the survey data, but of course if the survey data is noisy or very accurate we need to give an indication of how well the survey data supports the level of accuracy we're looking for. We could look at quantities such as the standard deviation Although this is a very um, common measurement in statistics and engineering, as an engineering dealing with the kind of measurements that we're dealing with, it's not a quantity that we have a lot of feel for. Um, based on a, a, a cloud, just appreciating the standard deviation of the thickness is, is quite difficult to do. So we probably need to come up with a far more practical quantity. So I chose the thickness of the cloud. And um, experience so far has suggested that this is quite a, a robust measure because we don't really have um, individual outlying points. Um, normally the cloud is quite well behaved, so the thickness is, is consistent generally across the, across the measurements. And then we need to think about how we display this data. And the ideal way is to go for the most graphical way possible. So this image shows the Megayop with the green area within the 10 millimeter absolute tolerance we've defined below. Red areas are areas of the surface that are outside of that. Areas that are clear are areas of the surface or the survey scan data that don't support the conclusion because there isn't enough data. Once we've calculated these statistics, we can then analyze at different levels of tolerance. If we increase the tolerance down to five millimeters, then we can see we've got a lot of more red areas. If we take account of the side that the surface is on, we see that scenario described previously where the, the surface is oscillating one from one side of the cloud to another. And then if we look at that uh, sidedness with respect to the thickness of the cloud, we can see so that the cloud is actually much thinner than the oscillations in the surface itself. 
and we need to uh, appreciate whether this is something that we need to consider as being important or not. As well as the graphics, we can still produce numerical statistics. This would give a global impression of the surface in terms of its mean error and its standard deviation, but this doesn't necessarily on its own give us a good feel for how well we're doing. Obviously with graphics we can go to other renderings. This is uh, an illustration of the surface being shaded with gradients to highlight areas that are worse than the other. So this is, can be used to target those areas of the surface that are worse than others. And in this image we can see the bilge kills and propeller areas and rudders highlighted as the red areas towards the bottom right of the image. So bringing this presentation to a conclusion to summarize what we've talked about, as we've presented here, the present approach is uh, really a series of disconnected solutions um, that have come from other areas of engineering. Uh, we have the surveying that when you go to dry docks, it can uh, be a difficult environment to scan, certainly for ships. There's areas that you cannot see. There's practical effects that can make the survey difficult to proceed with, such as the reflections. And then when you actually look at the process of turning that data into a surface, for hull forms, because there's some challenges within the area that the, the that's being surveyed, then you need to have something that you can use to influence the surface to be able to selectively capture which parts of the, the laser scan that you're going to use to generate the surface. And because some of the surfaces being generated are a lot more complicated than what we really want to be using inside the engineering domain, and we have a lot of surface generation tools already in the marine domain, well, it'd be nice if we could take that laser scan survey data into the, the surface definition environment. And the key takeaway from this research really is that you don't really get to see the, the quality of what you're producing until you introduce validation into the process. It really makes for a productive experience. It allows you to communicate the level of accuracy to your manager or to your customer, and it allows you to be directed to those areas of the surface that are in most need of correction. So thank you for watching. Here are some of the areas where you can get more information either by looking at the web page or contacting me directly by email.